This podcast is for anybody who spends time with children, whether they're parents, childcare professionals, teachers or grandparents. It doesn't matter how old the children are, whether they're babies, toddlers, tweens, teens and anything in between. I think you're going to find this useful. Hi, I'm Tony. I'm an author, presenter at Sky Sports and years ago I went to the jungle and got ill. Very (laughs) ill. So this is my podcast adventure to find more energy. It's packed with biohacking, science, health tech, supplements, and some of the most well-known experts on the planet. This is something I spent four months of my life doing with electrodes glued to my head so that you can do a lifetime worth of meditation. Decide what you don't give a fuck about, which is something you don't care about. Some of it gets quite out there. I had some stem cells sent up to my house that I had stored, and then I injected myself with mannitol. And we even hack hangovers. Alcohol is poisonous. So is water and oxygen in the wrong dosage. So that's my podcast, Zestology. Live life with energy, vitality, and motivation. Yeah, so something a little bit different today on Zestology. Welcome back to the podcast all about energy and vitality. And Sarah Ockwell smith is one of my favorite authors. I own quite a few of her books and so got in touch with her ages ago and it took us a long time to set up this interview. Her books have helped me so much with parenting and I know that the topic of this podcast isn't necessarily parenting but I also know when I get parenting right it gives me a lot of energy and when I get it wrong it takes a lot of energy away. How to Be a Calm Parent is out this week and it's her new book. It is part self-help and part parenting, which is why I thought it'd be very interesting for this podcast. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's aimed at parents who know that they need to be calmer to raise well-adjusted and happy children, but who struggle with their own uh, emotions and stress levels. So um, here it is, Sarah Ockwell smith one of my favourite interviews I've done in a long time. She is absolutely brilliant and has inspired me a lot. And here is Sarah on Zestology. Right, okay, we are recording. Sarah, it's so good to talk to you. Thank you for coming on Zestology. Oh, thank you for inviting me. Yeah, I listen, I never thought I'd think so much about parenting before I became a parent. There's, there's, yeah. there's, just, there's just so much to think about, isn't there? Yeah, I think we live in an age of actually too much information. I think the, the too much information makes it maybe a bit harder because it gives us way more to think about. Yeah, yeah, that's that's true. I, I, I'm always someone who sort of my instinct is the moment I encounter a problem, I'll mm-hmm. use all my brain power to try and solve it. And there yeah, are plen- yeah. there are plenty of those in parenting, aren't there? So um, so much so. Yeah, yeah. But your books have been so helpful to us, honestly. I mean, the, the general ones on parenting, especially the sleep ones that you've written. <laughs> um, we're currently more of a tantrum phase, and again, you've been, uh-huh. been so helpful. Um, and I know you've got two books coming out this year. So congratulations on that. And I Thank want to talk you. more about them in a second. But I thought it'd be useful to start because I know about the concept of gentle parenting. But perhaps uh-huh. you could explain to people what gentle parenting is to start off with. Yeah. So, you know, I'm sure anybody who's a parent listening, you'll find out really quickly that there's loads of different labels given to different types of parenting which is, seems to be a fairly new thing, to be honest. You know, my eldest is 19 now, and there just weren't really labels around then. But even more so, particularly with things like TikTok. So you're seeing the label gentle parenting more and more, um, which is the label that I use. There are, however, only three types of parenting. If you look at the science, which is authoritarian, authoritative and permissive. So authoritarian parenting is kind of like your old school Victorian, do as I say, not do as I do, lots of punishment, sort of governing by fear. Um, Permissive parenting is actually what a lot of people think gentle parenting is. It's um, there's two styles of permissive. One is when it's quite abusive and neglectful when parents don't really care, which is thankfully fairly rare. The other style of permissive parenting that I encounter a lot is when parents almost seem scared to make their children cry. Like they, they don't discipline because I don't know, they're worried about upsetting their children or being too authoritarian. So they go completely the other way and don't really have much discipline or boundaries or anything like that. And then there's the type in the middle, which is authoritative. 
which is really hard to say. You know, I've been doing this for <laughs> decades and I still can't, I still have to like stop and pause to think, remind myself how it's spelled and how to say it. Um, and authoritative parenting is basically sort of a nice middle ground. It's where you absolutely discipline and have rules and boundaries and you take control and don't let your children sort of run right and destroy everything, but you do it really respectfully. And you do it mindfully of the child's development. So you kind of all it, it's a really informed parenting style. So you you know you need to know a, a good deal about child development and is the behavior age appropriate? Is your discipline age appropriate? So it's quite it's very mindful. It's actually quite hard work. It's definitely not permissive. There's loads of um, discipline in it. So gentle parenting and actually a lot of the other styles you'll hear things like conscious parenting, mindful parenting, respectful parenting, attachment parenting, you know, all these labels, they pretty much just describe authoritative parenting. And if you look at the research, the parenting style that's shown to be the most effective and, and also to cause the least damage is always authoritative parenting. Mm. The problem is when you use that term, as I've just said, it's quite hard to say, it's even harder <laughs> to spell. And because it sounds like authoritarian, most people get it hugely mixed up. So I would really just like to use the term parenting, but parenting is kind of taken by the authoritarian crew in our society today. Like we think all discipline has to involve punishing and shaming children and making them feel bad for what they've done. So gentle parenting is just authoritative parenting, just a different name. Um, and if I was to sum it up really quickly, I would say it's just treating your kids in the way that you would have liked to have been treated as a child by your parents. Yeah, that's it, really. Because before I remember the thing I was most worried about when my wife Faith was pregnant was, oh, God, you know, how are we going to sleep? And I was chatting to one of my colleagues who said, oh, you know, we, we, we read this great sleep training book. And three months in, mm -hmm. we, we, we goes for sleep for 12 hours a night. And one of the things that resonated a lot with your writing was the fact that um, it's a much harder course to take. But there's but little children and babies and toddlers have very little control over their lives. So where you mm -hmm. can, giving them uh, more control while still laying out boundaries and establishing mm -hmm. the boundaries in life is actually really nice for them and, and actually um, brings the tantrums in a little bit. And I, I think that's yeah. massively important. And I try to remember that all the time. So, I mean, in our society today, we talk, thankfully, we talk so much about mental health, but I don't think we talk about enough about where mental health stems from which is our childhoods you know when we're babies and toddlers and for I would actually go so far as to say for most people in our society today we were probably raised with authoritarian methods of, methods of discipline we were maybe sleep trained maybe consciously or unconsciously we were left to cry and what we do then is we teach children from like literally month one that when you're scared or when you have big emotions or when you're angry or when you're not feeling great your role is to be good and to not bother your parents basically so what we're doing when we're punishing a toddler for having a tantrum or sleep training the baby and leaving them to cry so that they'll sleep through the night which they don't do by the way they just learn to be quiet they don't sleep any more than a baby who isn't sleep trained but what we teach them to do from very early on is to hide their emotions inside bury them down and basically from like the off we're teaching them to be unauthentic and to hide how they really feel. And then it's kind of like no wonder that teenagers have such poor mental health. And then parents really struggle when they're teenagers because that's the age that the kids really need to talk about how they're feeling. But they've spent their whole life so far being raised to not share it. And then you have, you know, I have four teenagers. I find them generally lovely to raise. But it's the stage that I think most parents struggle with the most, short of the sort of exhaustion of the newborn phase because there's such a disconnect between parent and teenagers and they, they don't feel comfortable to talk about how they're feeling because they spent all of their life till that point being told to not share. And then, you know, it carries on into adulthood in the um, book that I've just written, like literally the first chapter of it is to be a great parent. We need to unpack how we were raised because otherwise we just go through life just being constantly triggered, not necessarily by our children, by our response to them, which is based on how we were responded to as children ourselves. Mm. Mm. It's deep, big stuff, deep stuff. It is.
Yeah, it's, it's an incredible, I mean, it's almost a bit of a cliche, but what a journey you go on as a parent, because it really yeah. does bring up a lot of stuff, a lot of family stuff, actually. It's, it's, it's quite yeah. difficult for grandparents when, when, when grandchildren come along as well. Um, so hard. I mean, it's particularly if you do something differently. I think it must be really hard as a grandparent to see your children kind of shunning how they were raised. Yeah. You know, that must really hurt, mustn't it? But then you have yeah. like the, then you've got the parents saying, oh, you know, I wish my parents or my grandparents would understand and would support me. But, you know, we, I think we have to understand how difficult it is for the older generations as well yeah. to see research changes. We find out all the time that maybe things that they did or even things that I did are now maybe considered suboptimal or maybe even dangerous. So, yeah, I mean, it just throws up. If you have issues, you will find out about them very quickly when you become a parent whatever issues they are. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Interrupting this podcast for one moment to let you know that it is brought to you by the shortcut to more calm and more connectedness, Sensate, who are my podcast partners for this month. And not only that, by the way, if you're someone who wears an Oura ring, I think you can increase your heart rate variability using Sensate as well. It's a genius device. You hang it around your neck and it... um, through sort of conduction techniques makes your whole body vibrate and you listen to a soundtrack as well and what it does is fairly incredible at getting you into a different place quite quickly there is loads of science behind it you can do 10 minute sessions 20 minute sessions you do longer if you want but you know 20 minutes for me is plenty long enough to get into a very good state of relaxation it's nice before bed but in my experience if you do it an hour before bed you'll just drop off there and then. So you need to make sure you do it at exactly the right moment because it is really strong at supporting your stress response system. And let's face it, we all need a bit of that at the moment. If you go to getsensate.com slash Tony Wrighton, you can get 10% off by using the code Tony. That is getsensate.com slash Tony Wrighton. Use the code Tony and get 10% off it really does work well. Um, and it's sort of a shortcut to reducing stress and anxiety and staying cool, calm and collected. And I think one of the great things about this thing is that there's a lot of gadgets and tech advances in the biohacking world, which cost a lot. This is, you know, I mean, it's 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 an, a bit of an investment, but it's not a new mortgage. So getsensate.com slash Tony Rice and use the code Tony for 10% off. Now, back to the show. This is so great because obviously this isn't actually a parenting podcast, but I feel Mm -hmm. that so many of the issues that you talk about tie into so many of the themes that come up again and again on Zestology and are are Uh so relevant. And just going back to what you were saying about um, mental health when you're sort of very young, um, Mm -hmm. it is a case that, when I've, and I constantly try and remember this and it, when they're sort of um, having a tantrum or kicking off for want of a better phrase, they mm-hmm. are not a toddler. And my son is not being naughty. He's got sort of some mm-hmm. sort of unmet need and, he, and he's not old enough to regulate his emotions properly anyway. Therefore, punishing him and putting him on the naughty step just isn't a healthy way of dealing with that and a healthy way of le- mm-hmm. letting him express his emotions. And I don't think we realise, you know, there's, what has changed hugely in sort of the psychology and research in the last 30 or 40 years ago is the fact that we now understand much more about brain development. Like it's actually possible with sort of functional MRI scans and stuff to, to understand what happens to the brain as we develop. And I think the thing that I found most mind-blowing when I found out about it was that your brain doesn't finish developing until you're in your late 30s. Right. Uh, sorry, late 20s, approaching right. 30 in your late 20s. And the area of the brain that takes the longest to finish connecting and wiring up and myelinating, which is basically like sort of insulating an electrical table, is your neocortex. And that's the part of the brain responsible for the sort of executive control and what we call concrete thinking, which sort of outside of psychology speak, it means it's the area of the brain responsible for controlling emotions Um, responsible for impulse control, responsible for logical, rational thought, hypothetical thinking. You know, all of the things that we get really frustrated that toddlers or preschoolers or even teenagers don't have, and we try all sorts of discipline techniques to make them have impulse control and regulate their emotions, and they physically just can't. You know, their brain is just not developed enough to a degree 
that they can do it. And it doesn't matter how we raise them. You know, this, this, you're still not going to be able to stop a toddler tantruming. Yeah. And it, when you understand that, I think it actually takes a lot of pressure off of you as a parent because you realize it's not me. I'm not a failure. I've not created this little tyrant with what I'm doing wrong or something. It's mm. just, you know, it's biology. Well, this is why you've helped us so much, because whenever we go through and the phases, it, I mean, nobody tells you, but the phases change so much and mm -hmm. so quickly. Whenever we're going through a phase, we'll be like, well, what, what would Sarah Ockwell Smith say? And we'll go and have a look at like, <laughs> something on Instagram or one of your books. And um, and then we'll feel better about it because we know we're not alone and there's not, we're not doing anything wrong. And it's very natural. Yeah. Yeah. So but it's no, like we live and I mean, you probably talk about this with other things, but it's like we live in such a quick fix society today. We think that there are quick and easy solutions for everything, like magic answers and, you know, change your body in seven days or, you know, order something and get, some, get it delivered to you by a drone in six hours or something. We're all about the quick fixes. And it yeah. just it's not like that. You can't quickly fix a child who has an immature brain. It's you're in it for the long haul, which is really frustrating because you put all this work in and your child still tantrums or they still wake up through the night. But we need to shift away from that. I can train my child to do something in three days to actually this is going to be a bit of a slog for like 20 years. <laughs> and that, and that, you know, yeah. that kind of yeah. helps as well. I think it's. It's a double-edged sword. I think it helps because we realise we're doing nothing wrong. And then it doesn't help because you think, oh, my God, really? I've got another 20 years of this? Yeah. <laughs> I know. Yeah. The it's, more it's, you learn, the scarier yeah. it gets as well as the easier it gets. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, I mean, I'm very interested about your new book, How to Be a Calm Parent, because I noticed yeah. that when I'm not parenting well, if, if my son sort of shouts at me, for example, if, if my voice is raised back to him, there is no, there's no point. I mean, I'm basically doing what I'm telling him not to do or I want him not to do. So I'm, I'm yeah. quite interested. And I sort of crowdsourced this interview a little bit and some parents who listened came back and said, you know, they're very interested about the, the boundaries between calm and stressed and the, the, the warning <laughs> signals that might indicate to parents that they might be crossing those lines. So perhaps you can yeah. talk a bit about calm parenting and, and why it's important. Yeah. So, I mean, two things I would say, first of all, is I wrote the book. I've, people have been asking me to write this for years and I've written like 11 parenting books about different things so far. And it was kind of really triggered over COVID when for sort of various reasons, I did a lot of introspection to my own life. And it's, it's not an autobiographical book, but it's basically about the journey that I went on. And oh, like right. people seem to think as a parenting expert, I'm like this sort of uber zen, chilled out person who's got oh, yeah. her whole you are, life sorted. <laughs> and yeah, I'm so not. I'm like as screwed up as everybody else. So I, I had like on the one hand, this sort of personal change that I went through. And then I was... One thing I was doing that actually I advise people don't do in the book is sort of putting yourselves in situations that make you feel worse. And I was reading um, my reviews on Amazon, which you should never do if you're an author, but <laughs> I'm like glutton for punishment. And somebody had left me a one star review for my book about discipline and said, this book was terrible. Basically, it felt like all she was saying is if you have your shit together, so will your kids. And I'm like, that's kind of actually that is the sum of everything I've ever written. You know, yeah. It's true. As you say, you're your child's role model. It doesn't matter what techniques you employ. If you're constantly stressed and angry, you will raise a stressed and angry child. So mm. I'm like, I don't really understand why you give me one star because that is the premise of the book. Yeah, yeah. And then it kind of felt like, well, what I haven't done so far is to actually write a book to tell parents how to have their shit together. So it sort of came about from that. Um, but the one thing I really struggled with with the title is on the one hand, you need like the marketing and the buzzword and what title will sell really well. So how to be a calm parent. And then on the other hand, I'm thinking ethically, this really should be called how to be a calmer parent or a mm. sometimes calm parent, mm. because it is, it's not possible to be calm all the time. So I think no. you have to start with that. And it's not aiming to be perfect. I spend actually a lot of time in the book telling parents, actually, it's okay when you're not calm. It's okay to lose your temper. It's okay to scream and shout, which I think a lot of people are really shocked by. But it's knowing what to do when you do lose your temper and you do lose your calm to kind of make things right again. 
And actually, one thing I talk about is it's really important that we're not calm. And it's really important that we do mess up and we are stressed and shouty because it's only in those occasions that we can show our children how to apologize genuinely and reconnect when we've had, you know, as adults, we're really bad at disagreements and arguments because we don't know how to communicate and resolve them. So it's, mm. it's about that as well. But yeah, so, I mean, one of the chapters talks about knowing the signs of burnout, um, which in our lives today, you know, even taking COVID out of the equation, we are just all exhausted. Yeah. And we're, you know, we're trying to be brilliant at work and brilliant parents and you, you can't have everything. You have to make compromises and sacrifices. So there's a lot of talk. Um, there's a whole chapter on talking about perfectionism and how that's really damaging as a parent. Um, and how can there's a chapter on comparison, like, um, for instance, if you've, if you've got Instagram as a parent and then you're looking at somebody else's Instagram and they always seem calm and they're doing great activities and how you, it's not real, it's, is it? It's not real life. You're comparing no. your messy insides with the curated illusion of somebody else's. But I think what we must understand is there is no one answer to being karma because there are 101 different reasons why individually we all struggle. Mm. And the key is... It's sort of unpacking everything that leads us to that point. So even stress, you know, that the, there are thousands of causes of stress and they're unique for us all. So it's trying to find out what's uniquely happening to us and going on our own without sounding like a self-help cliche, like going on our own journey, yeah, yeah. which will be no, different I, to everybody else's. I do think that the, you know, despite knowing all the pitfalls of social media and, you know, it's nothing yeah. new to say, oh, you know, you shouldn't compare yourself to someone else on social media. When it comes to parenting, it takes up so much of your time in your headspace that we, for example, mm -hmm. have got some friends who had a baby six months or so ago and uh, they're, her Instagram feed in particular is beautifully curated. And all they seem to do is go to museums yeah. and galleries and meet for lunches. Of course, and and yeah. I have said more than once, we've said, why, why did we never deal with it as well as that? <laughs> we've had that conversation. Mm -hmm. So we fell into that, but even though we sort of know not to do that. So yeah, it is hard. Yeah. Parenting. Yeah. I remember like when I was younger, my house would be a complete tip. But if I took a picture for well, Facebook, because it was then, I would pick the corner that looked immaculate. And I'd be literally <laughs> surrounded like yeah. a bomb site. But my picture would look like I was like my house was immaculate. And that I was and I go and put my makeup on. And it's stupid. I don't know why we do it to ourselves. But yeah, that's, yeah. you know, and I think it's partly due to, you know, the the culture we live in now is so unsupportive of families and we don't, we don't raise our children with tribes and herds around us anymore. So mm. we've created this artificial one and, you know, it's even going further, isn't it? We'll create, we'll raise kids with the metaverse at some point, but we're trying to recreate those tribes and those herds and it can be so helpful and so useful, but it can also be so incredibly toxic. So, that that is one the of the answer. things. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the tribe thing is something that we've found really hard actually we are well aware mm. and a massive fan of writers like chris ryan and reading about you know how life was in, in, in sort of primal parenting um mm -hmm. a uh, we realized the importance of tribes but we didn't we don't really feel like we have enough of one and we've tried to build more one and i think it, you know now with our son almost three we've worked really mm -hmm. hard to do that but we don't have grandparents we can just call on at a whim and just get an, an afternoon off or a morning off and it does make yeah. it much harder do you what what is your thinking about sort of building a tribe when you don't necessarily have 15 relatives around to take your little cherub off your hands for a few minutes yeah, and it's so hard, isn't it? You know, I, I lost both my parents when I was in my early 20s and my husband's parents died just as we had our own children. So we and I'm an only child. So we are like completely isolated and alone. Um, in some respects, it doesn't bother me because um, being an only child, I'm quite introverted and I'm I've always been comfortable with my own company. But I think if also that doesn't mean that I don't need people. That's actually goes back to how I was raised and I find it hard to reach out to people anyway but if you are somebody that needs a tribe I think you unfortunately are I think sometimes first of all it may be that support's there but we don't ask for it so I think we need to get more comfortable with saying I'm actually really struggling could you possibly do anything to help even if that's sort of listening to you on the telephone but I think it means creating our own tribe. So I think that's where, you know, if you go to antenatal groups and baby groups, that can be really helpful. And I do think that 
social media can be really helpful. You know, I have a Facebook group with several thousands of parents who act like as a sort of a virtual tribe. But I think one thing we're really not very good at as adults is making friends. And actually I talk in the book about it. Like if you watch a young child and you take them to the park and they make friends within like three minutes yeah. And as adults, we're too much in our head and like we might go to a baby group or something and there might be someone we think, I think that person's quite cool. But then we're so anxious that we we don't say, hey, would you like to hang out for a coffee or something? We yeah. just sit and wait for them to ask us. So, yeah. and it, it, but it all comes back to how we were raised and we were not raised to do that and we weren't confident. But I think if you need the tribe, you can't wait for it to come to you. Yeah, You have yeah. to step out of your comfort zone. You have to talk to people. You have to try and learn how to make friends, which I know is just terrifying, but yeah. I think it's not just going to come to you, which is, we basically in our society, we do everything wrong when it comes to supporting parents, whether we're talking what the government does financially, whether we're talking about, you know, how oh, we don't nurture get me them started on that. as older generation. No, I know, but like older generation. <laughs> the amount of money like, I've spent on childcare. <laughs> Yeah, and you know, and you know, whole other thing I'm talking in the book about the fact that we as a, a nation don't value childcare workers enough. Like they earn minimum wage, yet arguably it's surely it's like one of the most important jobs they could ever be. Mm. But we give them minimum wage and all the nurseries are underfunded, and we have to start valuing the the people that care for our children, whether that's parents, whether that's caregivers, and we have to start supporting them properly, and that includes financially. Mm, mm. yeah I, I, you know who knows how you fix that <laughs> oh it's i mean it's because already um well it's not the individual's job is it i mean you know it just shouldn't it's su- it's no wonder that there's such a gender pay gap because for most mm-hmm. families it's not worth both both uh, parents going back to work so there's no. very difficult decisions to be made and surprise surprise guess what happens often the woman is the one who ends up looking after the children and it's just um it's but then just that a- also comes back to there's a fact in the UK that the government thought it was a great thing that they had shared parental leave. I think it's like the worst thing they've ever created because it's almost like, well, who's going to have it? One of them's yeah. going to sacrifice. Why should you be sharing it? There should yeah. be proper pay parental leave for both parents. Yeah. Yeah. My wife is just going to a new, um, a new company where their, um, their parenting policy is it doesn't matter what your gender, you get the same amount of leave and you get exactly the same rights and the same amount of money over a period of nine or 10 months. I mean, it's pretty forward thinking and not many yeah. companies do that. So that's that's probably the way forward. And that's the way to reduce the gender pay gap. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I know. I mean, it, it's clearly someone who's spent three years paying <laughs> well over a I thousand imagine, pounds yeah. a month of childcare. <laughs> um, I mean, I didn't with four kids. I simply I had to become self-employed because I we I just couldn't have afforded childcare. There was yeah. just no option. I couldn't have gone back to work and paid for four kids in childcare. You couldn't have. No, no, no. no. The it's really interesting what you were talking about in terms of how we're more frazzled than ever before. And I don't think you used that word, mm. but you used a similar word. And I know there's a chapter in your forthcoming book on working parents and we're both working mm. and there's not much spare bandwidth. And I think, you know, one of the topics that comes up again and again on this podcast is the fact that people just, they do not have enough bandwidth at the moment. And even once you finish your work mm. for the day and you put the kids to bed, you've got 15 WhatsApp messages to reply to before you even start thinking yeah. about relaxing. Um, it's uh, what, I mean, do you, do you look at that in your new book in terms of how we deal with stress and adrenaline and our stimulation levels? Yeah. I mean, the ultimate answer is to try and shake up the system, isn't it? But obviously, you know, that isn't something necessarily that we can do, certainly not by ourselves, but so, yeah, I mean, one of the things that, we tend to do um, as individuals when we are facing a problem, whether that's stress or another problem is we have what we call additive behavior. So we tend to think, what else can I do to make this better or stroke easier? And when we're really stressed or really tired, we're like, oh, I should go to the gym more or I should eat better or I should do X, Y, Z. And, you know, obviously they're all good things to do, but we add more pressure on ourselves when we keep thinking, oh, I need to solve this by adding more and doing more and changing this. And actually one of the things I talk about quite a lot is sometimes what actually the better answer is to do less. And it's what mm. can you take away yeah. that's really important. And we, but we don't think of that when we've got a problem and we just keep thinking, what can I add to solve it? Um, one thing that's huge is I talk about boundaries. A lot more. 
So um, this goes right back to sort of talking about our own upbringing, but I was raised to be a good girl and a caretaker. So my mum's um, health was quite fragile. And what I very quickly learned to do was basically just be really agreeable and meanable and do everything that was asked of me and not be a, a bother, which has then morphed into me being a people pleaser as an adult. And I find it really hard to say no to people. And I'm always the first one if like there's a local Facebook group and someone says, oh, has anybody got X, Y, Z or can anybody do this? I can't stop myself. I literally jump in and say, <laughs> yeah, sure. And I'll be juggling so much that what I've actually learned for me, the most powerful thing is I can just say no, Mm. but then learn to be comfortable to say no. So it sounds so small, but it's such a big thing to just say, I can't, I'm at capacity. I'm sorry. And just turn people away and say, no, do less. Um, You know, it's not a magic solution, but when we've got less on our plate and also to prioritize things to think, okay, I'd like to do all of this, but, what can I just put aside right for now and come back to that later? Yeah. And if yeah. you're talking about work, you know, can you talk to your boss and say, look, I'd really love to be able to do this, but I'm not giving it my all at the moment. Could I, could it go on a back seat for a bit or is there somebody else who could do it? And yeah. we're, we're just not good at doing that. I don't think. No boundaries and saying what you want. And that goes back to the ways that the way that we were, I mean, it's not, it's very British, isn't it? Does not say what you want but communicate what you want in some sort of Hmm. weird unspoken way. (laughs) Yeah. It's a, it's a very British thing. I think we're very scared of being seen as sort of impolite. Yeah. Yeah. And it comes back to how like our confidence as parents, like we want people to think we're doing it well and we want people to think that we're capable and we want people to think that we're kind, but we really have to prioritize ourselves, which is, you know, and I think, Probably this is worse for mums because we're seen as being like the more nurturing sex and, you know, we're expected to be kind and the helpers. But just to be able to just constantly say no to people has been so revolutionary for me and realising how uncomfortable I felt saying it for a very long time. Yeah. And then realising the pressure it takes off when you do say it is is quite insane. And just prioritising yourself after months or years of prioritising other people. Yeah. I think... um I know we're coming towards the end of our interview and I think, you know, one of the things that's resonated a lot with me and your work is this concept of um, being able to healthily express emotions. And I Mm -hmm. read a post that you put on Instagram recently about containment. And I've Mm -hmm. thought a lot about how I express my emotions and how I encourage my son to sort of, well, we try and give his emotions labels, all sorts of thing that you talk about. Yeah. I've, I've read it all, Sarah, don't worry. <laughs> I've got here somewhere. Um, so perhaps you could explain containment as that is something that resonated with me a lot and this concept of growing up emotionally balanced. Yeah, so the easiest, this sounds really bizarre, so bear with me. When I'm in a workshop, I always use kind of like bizarre analogies because people understand them more. So um, I always talk about the idea that I um, am not very good at kind of abstract or hypothetical thinking, which is also something young children struggle with. So um, I once bought lots of containers to store my cereal in because I thought it would stop it going stale that my kids keep leaving the boxes open. And I don't understand measurements. So online I bought these cereal containers and I thought they were massive and they arrived and they were like mini personal portion sizes which was obviously no good (laughs) but then if you imagine I'm trying to pour a family-sized box of cornflakes into this little personalized Tupperware thing just for one person very quickly if I carry on pouring the cornflakes the cornflakes are going to go everywhere so you know that the container is not going to hold them they're going to be spewing over the top and I'm going to be making a huge mess everywhere so what I've described there is basically if you think of the Tupperware container as the brain or the frontal lobe's ability to hold and um, kind of deal with all these big feelings and emotions. So that personal sized um, Tupperware container is like a toddler or a teenager's ability to hold these big emotions. They have a very small capacity for emotional regulation. So basically their emotions like cornflakes are just exploding everywhere when the world keeps pouring more cornflakes on them or more and more stuff at them. And if you imagine those cornflake explosions as like tantrums or meltdowns or whatever. So if the world keeps pouring more at them, that will just keep going. What we can do then as a parent or an adult is come along and say, hey, I'm mature. My brain is finished developing. I have a much bigger container. Mm. 
So first of all, let me see what the problem is and see if I can halt the pouring of cornflakes, which is basically, can I remove you from a situation that you're finding incredibly stressful? Because sometimes avoidance is actually the easy answer. And then come along and say, okay, so I'm mature. I've got a much bigger container. My capacity to hold these things is much bigger than yours. So I'm going to take off your cornflakes and put them all in my container. Um, so everything just becomes a lot calmer for you, mm. which is what you do when you support a child through a tantrum or something like that, um, verbally with hugs or just sitting with them. The problem comes when as adults, yes, we have a big container. Yes, we have mature brains with the capacity to control emotions and control our impulses. But our containers are also very full up with other cornflakes, which is right. our stuff. It's life. So it's work pressures. It's, I don't know, illness or having parents who are going through something or relationship struggles or money worries or all the adult stuff that we have to deal with day in, day out that takes up an awful lot of space in our container. Mm. So the problem is when we go to help our child with their cornflake explosion, we're like three quarters full with other stuff. So although we have a capacity to hold a lot of stuff, because it's so full up with life, we actually have very little space. And actually, we use this terminology an awful lot as adults. We say things like, I've had it up to here. I can't take any more. I'm full up. I yeah. literally am full to burst. Like we use that terminology so frequently without realizing it. Um, and obviously, when we're full up, we can't take on board our child's emotions. But not only that, the more that's added to our container, the more likely we are to have our own explosions. And then what you end up with is a dysregulated child and a dysregulated parent stroke carer. And then you're both adding more conflicts onto each other with your dysregulation and your own tantrums. And then you end up in just this complete and utter mess. <laughs> yeah. So what we need to do is we need to understand, actually, maybe the most important thing as a parent is we need to make space so that we can be the adult and mature for our children. So, it, understanding the, the, the whole emotion regulation and the cause of tantrums is important. Avoiding them when you can is important. But the most important thing I think any parent can do is make space. So yeah. what's in your container that you can work through? So maybe it's something from your childhood that you haven't gone through. Maybe you've got some unresolved trauma from some point in your life that you haven't dealt with. Maybe it's something that's happening at work at the moment. Maybe it's something in a relationship at the moment. Maybe you've not been sleeping enough. Maybe you've not been taking care of your health enough. But it's about what can I offload? What can I say no to? And how can I find a way to kind of give me space? So it's almost like imagine that there's this other massive container now that you can offload into. And that could be friends, family. It could be going to the pub. It could be jogging. It could be going to a yoga class, you know, whatever helps you. But finding a way for you to offload. Mm -hmm. And I think... We do parents a disservice when we talk about getting self-care all the time because self-care implies that's something else that they have to do and something else that they'll feel guilty for when they don't achieve it or they don't have time for it. And it's just another pressure. It's not about self-care and adding things. It's about emptying and making space, which is not the bubble bus and massages self-care that most people talk about. Like if you see an ad campaign about take care of yourself as a parent, it's always about massages and yoga and yeah. something that, yes, I'm not saying these things don't help, but if you fill up to the top, it's not going to help. And actually just adding something else might make things worse. So that's, it's about That's very helpful. Yeah. Psychologists call it do the work, but it's basically just thinking, what is it in your container that's taking up a lot of space mm. that you need to work through? Yeah, yeah. It basically all comes back to us, which is so terrifying. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Helpful, but also, which is, you know, gentle parenting is really bloody hard work. Authoritative parenting is really hard work because we realise actually it's all about us. It's not, we spend so long trying to change and fix our children but it's actually ourselves we need to change and fix. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I totally agree. Um, and as you know, we're, you know, we're sort of on the same page on on that score. So, look, thank you so much, Sarah. Your your book. I, I'm hoping this is going to be going out just as your book comes out. So, Perfect. when is the actual publish publication date? Um, March the third. So, Perfect. yeah, okay. it's we'll try and get it out. Paperback, that week, ebook, audiobook. Everywhere books are sold. Hopefully. Wow. Wow. Great. 
Well, there's, there's one question I ask everyone on this podcast, and that is, um, what is one book that you would recommend? And what is one tip that you would give for more energy and vitality? Hmm. I would probably say, and I can never pronounce this man's name, but Eckhart Tolle, The oh, Power yeah. of Now, yeah. which is probably yeah. not how you pronounce his name. But I think that had a, a really big impact on me in terms of kind of like living in the moment and trying not to stress too much about the past or the future and kind of making myself just just do things. And I guess, yeah, trying to, for me, trying to stop procrastinating is mm. is the big thing. And sometimes forcing myself to do things that I don't want to do is the maybe the best thing yeah because otherwise yeah. i am i will get very lethargic kind of mentally and emotionally if i put things off so Definitely. just going okay got to do it go and just do it now yeah yeah good stuff okay well the book is out at the beginning of march how to be a calm parent and you've got another book coming out in august called beginnings so you've been very busy and actually we made contact a while ago didn't we and you were like i can't do it now i'm, I'm writing all day <laughs> so me practicing being saying no because yes yeah. good good okay well, two I'm years glad. ago i said yeah all right and then been exhausted so <laughs> well i'm glad to help you with that and what's <laughs> um where can people find out more about you and your website and that sort of thing um so my website is just my name sarah Ockwell smith um and you know instagram facebook twitter tiktok all just my name great great well you've been published in 31 different languages so I have, apparently are, yeah which is wonderful um and thank you so much for all the inspiration you provided us honestly it's, it's really made a massive difference and we've learned so much from you so thanks for that oh, you're welcome thank you yeah thanks for coming on the podcast as well thank you Thank you to Sarah and thank you for listening to Zestology. Next week, the deputy editor of the Sunday Times magazine, who's written a brilliant book um, uh, around... Well, I'll tell you more about it next week, actually, uh, because Matt Rudd is really superb and um, looking forward to having him on the podcast next week. Uh, Before we finish, this podcast is brought to you by the wonderful Sensate. Hang it around your neck and feel loads better. And... You know, when I sign up with a podcast partner, I do a lot of due diligence on them. And in this case, just use the Sensate loads. I would not partner with a podcast uh, partner that I didn't love. And uh, if you go to getsensate.com slash Tony Wrighton, you'll see why I love it. It's absolutely brilliant. And you can use the code Tony10 for 10% off. And uh, yeah, it's just, it's a very impressive bit of kit that helps you sort of meditate, relax calm down and get in the moment and i think the way things are at the moment in the world we need that more than ever in fact i've definitely felt my anxiety levels rising in recent times and so i i have needed it i don't know about you um so let me know how you get on with that and thanks for listening to today's podcast as i walk past a sort of slightly leaky drain What a great way to finish this podcast. Don't know if you can hear that, but if you can, it just sort of sums it all up, really, doesn't it? Oh, and that as well. I mean, that's the great thing about recording things out and about. You never know what's going to happen. (laughs) An inauspicious end to uh, what I think was a cracking podcast with Sarah. Thanks for listening.